Hi everyone, and welcome back to the 42nd video for the New Testament Survey Course. In this section, we'll look at the third epistle of John. As usual, let's start with the historical background for this letter. The author is John, the same person who wrote 1st and 2nd John, who, by the way, also wrote the Gospel of John and Revelation. And in this letter, he referred to himself as the Elder, just like he did in 2nd John. And the recipient is a man named Gaius, whom John called his dear friend. Gaius was a Christian in a local congregation, likely near Ephesus, but he was almost certainly not the pastor, based on what we'll see in a moment. The date of this book is the same as 1st and 2nd John. It's unknown for certain, but probably somewhere between 85 and 90 AD. Now, the occasion of 3rd John was the need for hospitality for traveling ministers. This was before the days of Motel 6, and missionaries relied on the hospitality of good people in order to travel. And this need was compounded in this case by a power struggle with an arrogant wannabe who was refusing to offer hospitality and was hindering true ministry for the sake of personal glorification. And so, the purpose of this letter was first, to thank and encourage a friend who had been providing hospitality, but also to indirectly warn the jerk named Diotrephes who had been playing selfish power games. He was likely the pastor of that local congregation. Notice that John did not send the letter to the church, but to an individual in the church. Because as John mentioned in this letter, he tried to write to the church, but Diotrephes rejected John's authority and refused his instructions for these same selfish reasons. But by writing to Gaius, John assumed that Diotrephes would find out that the one with authority had given him notice on this issue. And the purpose of this letter was also to commend a specific traveling minister named Demetrius to hospitality and help for his ministry. And the organization of 3rd John is very similar to 2nd John. The simple outline starts with a standard epistle introduction containing a salutation, blessing, and thanksgiving, and then is the main body of the letter, which has a few subsections. First is to commend Gaius for the hospitality that he had given to strangers. And then John mentioned that the work of traveling ministers is worthy work and should be supported with this kind of hospitality. And then John transitioned to talk about the arrogance of Diotrephes and how he not only refused to take part in the ministry of John and his associates, but was actively hindering it and speaking against it. And the last subsection is an encouragement to receive Demetrius, whom John recommended as worthy of help. And then this epistle ends with a standard conclusion, including notice of John's intended visit, a peace wish, and final greetings. That's the organization of the short book. Now, let's examine the content by looking at some key verses. First is verses 3 and 4, which say, It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. In this passage, John expressed his joy in Gaius' faithfulness to the truth and his joy that he was walking in truth. You might remember that John used the phrase walking in truth in 2nd John as well. And John showed a genuine pastor's heart, having joy that others were following Jesus by walking in the truth. And this also clearly tells us that Gaius was a good guy, a genuine believer whose godliness John trusted. And then in verses 5 through 8, John wrote, You are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth." In this passage, Gaius was commended for his hospitality and love, and he was asked to send the brothers out in a worthy manner. And the reason given was that they went out for the sake of the name. They were serving Christ for the glory of His name 
and spreading the message about Jesus and his salvation, and they relied on Christian support. Therefore, it is right to receive and support such as these, and doing so is to partner in their work for truth. You might remember in 2 John, he warned them not to welcome false teachers, because that would be to share in their deceitful ministry. And in this book, he said that to welcome godly teachers is to share in their good ministry. Next is verses 9 and 10, which say, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Notice how Diotrephes is described in this passage. He loved to be first. In other words, he was a selfish control freak. He made it all about himself. He rejected and slandered John, the disciple that Jesus loved, because of his selfish pride and ambition. And he hindered genuine ministry, refusing to welcome missionaries sent from other churches. And he even punished those who would help. He hindered others simply to make himself seem more important. What a jerk. And this is horrible to see in a church, especially in a leader. Unfortunately, it does happen, and it is a temptation to any leader to let your ego get so big that you turn into this kind of person. But John warned that he will expose him for what he is. And this implied that John would exercise some form of discipline. And we know that God somehow corrected him and brought about justice in this situation. Though this letter doesn't tell us how the situation worked out, we know that God is just, and he somehow brought correction or some form of appropriate punishment. And Diotrephes is forever infamous, permanently memorialized in the Bible as a warning so that all leaders would guard their hearts and not be like him. And last is verse 11. It says, Dear friends, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. This passage is an encouragement to Gaius to avoid all kinds of evil, especially as given by the example of Diotrephes. Rather, he is to follow the good example of people like Demetrius, who will be mentioned right after this verse. And of course, this is an encouragement for all of us to do the same. But John also gave a general wisdom truth and standard for discernment. Whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil does not know God. Or to put it another way, we can judge a tree by its fruit. We can judge a person by their overall actions over time, because their character and heart will always eventually come out in what they do. These, then, are some of the key verses from this short book. Now, Let's examine the theological themes of 3 John. The first theme is walking in truth. We've already seen this idea in 2 John. Walking has the connotation of lifestyle, and truth is that which is in conformity with reality, especially the reality of who Jesus is. This is the goal of the Christian life, to live in conformity with Christ, to be obedient to his commands, and to be transformed into his character. And it brought John joy to see people walking in truth. And this should be the goal of any Christian leader, that those people under their influence should do the same. And speaking of Christian leaders, the next theme is worthy leaders. In this book, this is modeled by Gaius and Demetrius. John said they did what they did for the sake of the name. In other words, they were serving Christ and working for his glory. And reputation. And some did this by personal risk in traveling and relying on the hospitality of others for support, and some did this by providing that hospitality and support for worthy leaders and sending them out in a worthy manner. The church needs good leaders, and 3 John gives one aspect of what good leaders are to be and to do. And the last theme shows the opposite it's about unworthy leaders. And in this book, this is modeled by Diotrephes. Unworthy leaders love to be first. 
their leadership is centered on them and primarily serves themselves. Even if it appears that they're serving others, they only do it for selfish motives, for selfish glory. And like I mentioned, this is the classic selfish, self-important, arrogant jerk. Hindering others to make themselves seem more important. Using others to make themselves look good. Unfortunately, this kind of person does exist in churches, and it's harmful to the people and to the church's mission. Now, a while back, I saw a few testimony videos by people who did put Christ first and others first, and they all had the tagline of, I am second. I really like the ones I saw, and I recommend checking them out, but I also highly recommend that kind of attitude. I think, I am second, I am not the most important, is a great attitude which Christians, especially Christian leaders, should have as an antidote to the kind of unworthy leadership shown as a warning in 3 John. These, then, are the theological themes. And now, let's review. The organization of 3 John is intro, body, and conclusion. If you need a memory aid, memorize the organization of 2 John, because it's the same as 3 John. And the themes of 3 John are walking in truth, worthy leaders, and unworthy leaders. So, that's all for our survey examination of this short but powerful book. I hope that you take its message to heart and put it into practice. In the next section, we'll look at the last of the general epistles, the epistle from Jude, and I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.